Good afternoon. Welcome again for what is the third keynote lecture in our Lustrum series, this time for uh, the politics part. And I'm very glad to, uh, that we have, uh, could be able to ask Noortje Thijssen, uh, director of uh, the Scientific Bureau of uh, the Green Party in the Netherlands, uh, to address us with uh, the third lecture. Uh, she's been working at the interface of politics, uh, academia, and public life with uh, functions in uh, the Green Party in the Netherlands. She did a PhD in sociology and she's worked in consultancy. And she's here uh, to give a lecture on the relationship between science and politics, friends or foes. So, Dr. Tyson, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I will share my screen. Okay, is it clear for everyone? Well, um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be here and uh, I'm excited that you are here because uh, it's almost weekend and it's a bright sunny day. So I'm honored uh, with everyone uh, who's attending uh, my lecture. Um, yeah, my name is Norgie Thijssen. I'm the director of the Scientific Bureau uh, of GroenLinks. Uh, and today we're gonna talk about uh, the subject that really fascinates me, uh, the relationship between science and politics. Um, the main question is, are they friends or are they foes? Um, and for me, it is uh, a double ch uh, challenge because uh, normally I give lectures in Dutch and uh, this time I do it in English. Uh, and secondly, uh, I also really miss the interaction uh, with you, with the audience. Uh, so I'm really glad that we're having uh, the options uh, to chat uh, and to use the chat box. And I will also use the Mentimeter to have uh, yeah, some interactions uh, with you. Um, so what is uh, today all about? Uh, this is the program. Uh, first, I will start with a personal introduction and some more information on the Scientific Bureau. Uh, and then um, it's all about science and politics, uh, the main issue of, of today. And uh, I will show you that there is no black and white uh, for those two uh, important uh, themes in, uh, in life. Uh, what I also want to do is uh, I want to zoom in into two cases. Uh, those are two very actual cases. Uh, one is on uh, fighting climate change and the other one is on the COVID uh, crisis. And uh, to conclude, I want to end with a statement. Um, and the statement is why we shouldn't instill a non-partisan cabinet or in Dutch, uh, a Zaken cabinet. I have uh, three key messages uh, for today. Um, I, will, um, I will tell them already what it is, because I hope that you will remember uh, better what it is in the end of my, uh, in the end of my uh, lecture. Uh, first, I want to show that science and politics are not as different as is often assumed. Uh, secondly, I want to explain why emotions and opinions matter in politics. In other words, you cannot govern on the basis of science and insi of scientific insights alone. And finally, uh, science can be supportive when making policy, but it cannot be all determining. So those are my three main questions. Okay, uh, first, uh, a personal introduction. Um, and yeah, the Dean, uh, Mr. De Kock had already given me uh, a brief introduction, but what I want to, uh, to show you now is how science and politics uh, run like a thread through my whole career. So I will tell you what I did before and I will link that uh, to the subject of today. Um, and, the, and the beauty of my career is that it has come full circle. Uh, because uh, years ago, in uh, 2005, I started as uh, a trainee for the Scientific uh, Bureau. Um, I studied sociology in, in Utrecht. Uh, and after uh, my study, I wanted to pick up uh, a second master's. I wanted to study a political science. So I was thinking, what is the best way how to bridge those two masters? Um, and by 
yeah, by doing so, I thought uh, the best thing to do is do an internship at the Scientific Bureau of a political party. So I wrote two letters, uh, one uh, to the Social Democratic Party, uh, the PvdA, their institute is called the Bjarni Beckman Stichting, and I wrote one letter uh, to the Green Party. And I was very fortunate uh, because um, I could choose uh, to which I wanted to work for. Um, and in those years, uh, the, PV, the PvdA was a really big party, 42 seats in parliament. Uh, yeah, as you uh, see the parliament now and, and the distribution of seats, it's unbelievable how many seats uh, yeah, parties could have uh, in those years. So I thought, shall I choose for my uh, career and we had all the opportunities in a, in a big organization or shall I follow my ideals and shall I choose uh, yeah, the lower uh, or the smaller political party? Uh, and I choose to choose uh, my ideals. And that is one of my tips for you. Always follow your heart when it comes to your career. Um, and during my internship, uh, the, the cabinet of uh, Balkan and the two, it, uh, it, it fell. Um, so there were elections. And uh, despite the fact that GroenLinks uh, lost the elections with one seat, uh, we went from eight seats in parliament, uh, the same as what we're having right now. We went back to seven uh, seats in parliament, uh, but I was lucky again uh, because I could stay at the scientific bureau uh, and they offered me a job. Um, they were also reorganiz uh, reorganizing uh, the parliamentary group. And also there they offered me a job uh, to work as a policy advisor. And uh, again, I was in trouble because I had to make a decision. So it was a dilemma for me. Uh, but this time, my solution uh, was to do it both. Uh, so for two days a week, I worked for the scientific bureau. And for three days a week, I worked in the parliamentary group. And in the, um, in the uh, scientific bureau, I had the opportunity to do a PhD research. And that research was all about uh, the 60s and the memories of the 60s and the way how the memories of the 60s uh, are still of impact in the political debate. So it's not about what actually happened in those years, but it's all about the perception of the, that era. Um, and for me, this is, uh, yeah, it, it's really uh, a combination of, of the story what I, I try to tell you now, because it's also about perceptions and of people and not about factual uh, situation. Um, I also worked uh, for the parliamentary group, and that was very important to me uh, because I learned how policy is made, uh, and I also learned how it works with political interests and how, uh, yeah, interest groups try to, uh, yeah, try to influence you and how you can can deal with that. Um, but later on, this comes back into my career uh, after eight, nine years, I thought it's time to break out of politics and do something completely different. So I started to work as a PR manager for a startup. Um, and this was all about, yeah, building an image uh, that, yeah, that is what you have to do as a PR manager. Um, and I found out that that was not really uh, what I liked and what I was good at. Uh, so then I started to join uh, a lobbyist firm and I became a partner at the lobbyist firm and uh, that was of great value because that was uh, where I really learned how to, uh, yeah, how, how to deal with uh, with interests of other people and how to bring that into parliament. So politicians are able to make uh, well uh, informed decisions. Um, I think this is the most important uh, for my personal introduction, and some of those elements will come back uh, uh, in in the rest of my uh, my story of today. Um, first, a bit more on the uh, on, on the bureau itself. How are we uh, situated in the in the political uh, domain? Um, I think it's very interesting where we are posi positioned uh, because we are in the middle uh, between the political party itself and the external world. Um, so what we do, we bridge those two worlds. Um, we are part of the ecosystem of the Green Party. Um, and that's not only because we want to be part of it, but it's also what the law asks us to do. Uh, every uh, political party with members and seats in parliament uh, can have subsidy uh, to, yeah, to build an own a scientific uh, institute. 
um, and it should be all based on the benefit of that party. So that is how it's formulated in, uh, in law. But at the same time, we are also independent. Uh, we are an autonomous institute, uh, so we do everything uh, in an independent way. Uh, so it is a bit, uh, yeah, there is a bit of tension in between, because at one hand we are independent, and at the other hand we work for the benefits uh, of the Green Party. Um, and as I told you, uh, yeah, we try to, to bridge the gap between the political party and the external world. So think of uh, the academia, uh, but also of the NGOs and uh, businesses. Uh, and for all those uh, yeah, institutions, it's easier uh, to collaborate with us because we are independent. And that's easier uh, than be being super political as yeah, the, the group itself is. Uh, so I really like this, uh, this place to work for. And what do we do? Very briefly, uh, we, we think and we write um, and we, uh, we discuss. Uh, that is mainly what we do on a day. Uh, so we can make reports, we, we write books, we write essays, uh, but we also publish on our own uh, channels. We have our own magazine, it's called The Helling. And uh, since a year, we are having our, our own podcast. And in that podcast, we talk with other scientists, but also with, um, yeah, with, with experts from the field, uh, because we try to, to make that bridge. And we hope that the, uh, the, the local politicians and the national politicians of, uh, of the Green Party uh, will listen to that. Um, and of course, we have a networking function. Uh, we uh, do a lot of uh, networking activities. Uh, we, we present, uh, yeah, we, we do debates, we organize masterclasses. Uh, so that's also uh, how we try to, to make that bridge. So I hope it's clear what we're doing, but um, take a look at our website and you see all the, the detailed projects. Okay, um, let's start more in depth about, uh, about the, the team itself, um, because we talk about the relationship between uh, science and politics. And uh, I, I made this scheme um, because I, yeah, I, I tried to, uh, yeah, and I think it, it is a bit of a no-brainer, but what I try to do is to, uh, to make clear what, what knowledge is and politics is, but what I try to, uh, uh, to um, put emphasis on is that it's not so different. Um, science can be understood as the pursuit of knowledge and politics can be understood as the allocation of values. This is in a nutshell, of course. Um, and at the one hand, it is all about knowledge. Then we look at the left side of the spectrum. And on the other hand, uh, it is about values. Then we take a look at the right side of the spectrum. And uh, most associations with knowledge is uh, searching for truth and reasoning. Uh, it relies on hard data, on dry facts, on digital means. It's either X or it's either I. And at the very other end of the spectrum, uh, there are totally different associations. Truth is opposed to manipulation or lies, for example. So for many people, and I hope this is a minority, uh, these are associations that they think it belongs to politics. Uh, and maybe I'm a bit ex exaggerating here um, because data shows that it's not totally true. Uh, trust in politics is still quite high, uh, especially in the Netherlands. Uh, but still, the associations on politics can be quite negative. Um, and the Edelman Trust Barometer, I don't know if you are familiar with it, but they show that there is also a big distinction uh, between the, the, the educated, the highly educated people. They have a lot of trust in politics, but people with uh, fewer opportunities in society, they have more distrust uh, towards institutions. And... Um, yeah, those people are, of course, more dependent on government. And as you can see in the child care allowance affair, um, it made clear that experiences with the government cannot be only positive. So I can imagine why there is a, a, a big difference between um, yeah, the highly educated people and the people who are more uh, dependent on government. So on the right side, there are the manipulations, the lies, the deep fake. Uh, and these are the associations that are attached to politics. And I absolutely do not recognize myself uh, in this kind of uh, typologies, but I do understand where this is coming from. 
because there are a lot of scandals that lead to this image. Um, I think of uh, Mark Rutte, our own prime minister, who has an active memory that is sometimes a bit lacking, um, but from a total different order. I'm also thinking of Donald Trump, the president, the former president of the US. He believed his own lies. Uh, and a very bizarre example, it, uh, it's very recent, uh, was uh, a conversation in the lower house uh, with someone who pretended to be the Russian, uh, an employee of the Russian opposition leader, Navalny, uh, and this video turned out to be deep fake. So I can imagine where all these associations are coming from. And so we come to the extreme ends of the, of the spectrum. Science is associated uh, with the search for truth and knowledge and politics uh, is extreme. In its extremes, it's all about manipulation and deception. But my plea um, is that reality lies in the middle, of course. As social scientists, we know that science is based on interpretations, but also on constructs, assumptions, and recent choices. So the voice of the individual scientist can be heard in this. And there is nothing wrong with that. As long as there is transparency and there is accountability, uh, then there is nothing wrong uh, with an interpretation of a personal uh, or of an individual scientist. So show why you make which choices and make sure that everyone can replicate it. I think that is the core of what political science is and not only political science, but science in general. Uh, and politics is also more factual and responsible than the picture uh, that I presented on the right side of the spectrum. Again, the voice of the individual politician or policymaker is present here. Politics is a struggle for different perspectives, interests, ideals, beliefs. So the final outcome uh, can maybe an exchange between different points of views. Think of a coalition agreement of uh, one of the former cabinets of the, the Rutte II uh, cabinet. It was formed on the basis of a game uh, where they played games, uh, a card game, uh, Quartetta, it's, uh, it's a name in Dutch. Um, so it led to an exchange of, uh, of interests. And this is not typically Dutch. In Ireland, for example, in, Aust in Austria, uh, you see the same uh, strategy happening uh, between the conservative liberal parties and the green parties who are governing there. Uh, so it was really, I give you this and uh, you get this in return. In the Netherlands, of course, we are uh, more used to uh, compromising, uh, making compromises. Um, so we meet each other in the middle. Uh, and the advantage is that everyone gets their way a little, but no one is really happy. Um, but this is a clear example of yeah, dealing with the different perspectives and, uh, and, and values that, that are there. So in a political battle of interests, transparency and accountability are the keys to a well-functioning system. So it's exactly the same as in, uh, in science. So from the perspectives of the, the Liberal Party, the VVD, which attaches great value to Dutch businesses, it's not surprising that they are happy to enter into talks with a company like Shell. Um, but at the same time, the Green Party, for example, um, we want to have, uh, yeah, to combat climate change. So it's very likely that we have uh, very much uh, talks and uh, we are very much um, interlinked with Greenpeace and other green NGOs. And what I hope is that also the VVD wants to talk with Greenpeace. And at the same time, I really hope that the Green Party uh, wants to have a dialogue uh, with Shell. I think there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, as long as there is transparency when it comes to policy and legislation. Um, so you need to, uh, to be transparent in the interests that you want to, uh, to, to, to see uh, reflected in the end result. And I think as long as there is transparency, there is no problem. And that's the same with science. So you see there are similarities between social science and politics, and the voice of the practitioner should be always heard in this. And this requires openness and insights into all the considerations and the choices that are made. Uh, and this makes it traceable and also imitable. And it also invites scientific discussion and political debate. And these are important means of keeping power sharp and also in balance. So I think 
when this is all in these conditions, there is a healthy system. Okay, uh, this slide uh, shows in a nutshell the history of science towards more value-driven science. So for centuries, science was guided by reasoning and rationalization. And later, I will show you that this shift is, uh, shifted into justice. So we start first in the 15th and the 16th centuries. Uh, this was the transition period uh, between the Middle Ages and the modern ages. And in this period, science went back to the classical age. So the time of the ancient Greek and Roman thinkers, those were the inspirational sources. Uh, but later in the 17th and the 18th century, uh, the enlightenment uh, came up and the enlightenment thinking is still the basis for both science and political movements. Uh, the key word is progress. Reasoning was central to it and the discovery of laws. The goal of this movement was to rely on facts and it was a reaction against author authoritarian uh, thinking and religion received criticism for the first time. And in the 90s, uh, you see that other uh, thinkers emerged. Uh, they elaborated on the enlightenment thinking, uh, but there was a, a, yeah, a, little, a little difference, uh, especially Weber. He spoke of the enchantment of the world, um, and it revolved around the idea that problems could be solved with rationality and with technology. So there was less room for magic. And I think this this way of thinking, it, it, it emerged for many, many years and only in the 60s, I, I think it changed. Um, the, the trends uh, towards uh, rationalization uh, seemed to change into a trend where critical uh, thinking emerged. So the central question that came to the fore was, what is reasonable and what is just? And th this question is, super much based on morality. So what is reasonable, it depends, of course, on someone's perspective. Um, we can say that in the 60s, the more value driven politics uh, be began to appear. And I think right now we, uh, we can still see this, uh, also how it is uh, resonated in, uh, in politics itself. So also a brief uh, history on, on, uh, on the political uh, development. Uh, this slide shows in large uh, steps how the political discourse has changed over the years. And uh, this time I go back uh, to the post-war period and I look back uh, on where we are standing now. Um, and I mainly look at uh, the situation in the Netherlands, uh, but I can imagine that this is more universal than only the Netherlands. Uh, but what is quite unique for the Netherlands uh, was the situation um, yeah, that was here in the, yeah, up until the 60s. So in, it was the pillarized uh, situation of the 50s. Um, politics was based on an exchange of interests within the various pillars. And the political leaders of the three main pillars, uh, they negotiated about the different interests. So those were the uh, confessionals, the social democrats and the liberals. And each pillar had its own newspaper that reported on these matters. And that is how they reached the living rooms. Uh, so politics revolved around interests, but the political leaders, they determined uh, what those interests should be. And in the end of the 60s, this system came to an end. Social trends freed the individual from the authoritarian, authoritarian institutions. Think of the trends like individualization, secularization, democratization, emancipation. Uh, all the progressive social movements, they push this kind of trends. And with the television introduced, everyone could watch. And progressive social movements emerged um, and in the Netherlands, the political elites, they reacted in a very typical way. And that this was really different compared to other countries. Uh, it, the political elite, they made use of repressive tolerance. So they gave in to the wishes that existed in order to keep control over the outcome. And the result was that the social movements through the political elite uh, gained influence on political decision making. And they were also represented in politics itself, those social movements. 
um, think of the uh, yeah of a stream within the the PvdA, the Social Democratic Party, uh, but also think of uh, D66, our uh, yeah our Lib Dem party uh, that was founded in the 60s, and also the Green Party, uh, the predecessors of the the Green Party are the the PPR and the PSP. It's very Dutch, but they were also originally coming from the 60s. So in contrast to the cultural political revolt of the 60s and the 70s, uh, where the progressive values uh, were central, uh, in the 80s, we see a change of the political climate. The economy and employment were not doing well. So the problems could be solved with more market and with less government. That was the idea. It was the time of neoliberalism and the time of new public management. So the leading values for reforming the public sector were economy, efficiency and effectiveness. And here we see a clear trend of rationalization. In the 90s, uh, we see this development uh, further. In politics, uh, we talk about the third way uh, and political leaders uh, such as Wim Kok, but also Blair and Clinton, they use market mechanisms to organize the public sector and the welfare state. So public services were pri privatized. And uh, Anthony Giddens, he was the ideologist who called this the third way. And it was called the third way because the neoliberal ideas were used to achieve social democratic goals. So questions that rose in those years was, was this the end of ideology? But even was this the end of history? A very famous book of uh, Francis Fukuyama, he stated that it was the end of history. Uh, because liberal thinking was not longer contested. So the period in which values and the struggle over ideologies were less important in politics came to an end after the turn of the century. We all know the terrorist attacks. They took place in New York, in Madrid, in London, but also in the Netherlands. The politician uh, Pim Fortuyn uh, was killed, but also uh, Theo van Gogh. The political debate became a debate about identity politics. And it's not longer revolved around the question who gets what in a welfare state and how do we arrange this as efficiently as possible? No, the central question was who belongs and who does not. In other words, the cultural issues became important again. And this is not about reason and efficiency. This is all about values. It's about feelings, it's about perceptions. So in principle, there is nothing wrong with values, perspectives, and feelings. I think there's nothing wrong if they have a place in the political discourse. Uh, in fact, I think politics would do well to take them into account and be open about them. Um, the American uh, philosopher, her name is uh, Martha Nussbaum, uh, she writes about this in her beautiful books. Um, she tells us how important it is that there are emotions in politics. She writes about anger, forgiveness, love, compassion, shame, trust, and she pleads for more empathy in political thinking. And the question is now, uh, do we not go too far in this? And what happens when emotions and perceptions prevail and facts and reason no longer matter? I think that we end up in another political dimension and we call that dimension uh, the period of fact-free politics. And maybe this is where we are uh, for 10 years now. Um, in, in September 2010, uh, Bill Clinton uh, was the person who, who coined this, the, this idea of fact-free politics. In a television broadcast, he talked about Sarah Palin, the, the leader of the Tea Party, the Republican Tea Party, and he wondered uh, if we were uh, entering a fact-free politics era. Uh, I don't know why he was stating this, um, and I don't think it really matters. Uh, but what does matter is that this, this term became, uh, became uh, very accepted, uh, also in the Netherlands itself. Um, the, the term blew over uh, to the Netherlands. Uh, it was Femke Halsema, the political leader by then of the Green Party, who used it for the first time in a political debate um, to, to talk about the, the policies of the first uh, or the second cabinet of, uh, of uh, Mr. Rutte. 
um, and also journalists, they started to write about it. So newspapers, they all introduce their own fact checks. Uh, they try to assess uh, politician statements through the fact check. And journalists, uh, they didn't stop doing so. Uh, very recent, uh, the Washington Post, for example, uh, they counted all the lies of President Trump. Uh, you can see in my slide on the, in the right corner uh, how many lies uh, yeah, he, he made in, in not more than, or a bit more than 1,000 uh, days. So it's, it's, it's kind of extreme. Um, Professor Louise Fresco in the Netherlands, uh, she, uh, she did a lecture in 2011. Um, and it's really uh, recommended to read the lecture. It has a beautiful uh, title, Facts in Abundance. And she makes a distinction between facts and opinions. In a debate on sustainability, she sees more and more opinions dominating. So while there is more and more facts and insights available, uh, people do more uh, pick and choose. So she sees a development taking place where people are shopping from all the facts in order to be able to substantiate their own opinions or they use the facts to discredit the opponent. Um, and this brings me to what I call uh, the knowledge trust uh, paradox. On the one hand, uh, we see that trust in institutions is declining as a long-term trend and um, right before I stated that there was still uh, yeah, a lot of trust in institutions, especially in the Netherlands. Uh, however, you do see uh, some, uh, yeah, some, some decline there. And on the other hand, we see that knowledge is increasing. We know more and more, and there is more and more information available. So where there is a lot of knowledge and information, but little institutional trust, there is room for factory politics or rather there's room for cherry picking in order to substantiate one's own opinion and to distrust the knowledge and the insights of the authorities. And a clear example of this is the, the Freedom Party, the PVV of uh, Geert Wilders. Uh, they took a stand against the uh, KNMI, that's the Weather Institute uh, in the Netherlands, uh, because they publish information on climate change. So they rejected the institution because they didn't believe in climate change. So since the rise of uh, populism, politicians have been doing their best to win trust. That's what you can see. Um, and we see that politicians no longer just want to convince on the basis of knowledge and facts. They have read the books of Martha Nussbaum. That's what I think, because they are adopting an empathic stance. Under Obama's regime, uh, Joe the Plumber uh, was uh, introduced uh, by his uh, opponent, uh, John McCain. In 2008, in the de debates, uh, John McCain, he, he talked about Joe the Plumber uh, to symbolize what the interests were of the small businesses. And this phenomenon is also visible in the Netherlands. Uh, there are a lot of examples to make. For example, uh, Mark Rutte, he always talks about uh, the hardworking Dutchman. Um, but we also see uh, Geert Wilders introducing uh, the figures Henk and Ingrid to talk about yeah, ordinary people. And uh, very recent in one of the uh, political debates uh, during election time, Jesse Klaver talked about his sister uh, to, to show that he knows how it is to be uh, a, a healthcare professional uh, because his sister is one. And it's not only that politicians who like to use ordinary people to tell their story, also the media make more and more uh, use of this. Um, and we have seen this in those election debates uh, of two months ago. Um, a really good example uh, was uh, President uh, Rutte. He was confronted with this lady uh, on this picture. Her name is uh, Christy Rongen. Uh, and Christy was one of the victims of the child allowance affair. And she said clearly to him, you are letting us down. And I think this was the only moment in all the political debates uh, so far uh, where uh, Mark Rutte uh, found it visibly very, very difficult. So I don't know whether politics of identification leads to more political trust among people, uh, but I think this example of Christy Ronga shows that it can be necessary to give a face to the impact of policy to convince politicians.
And in a debate uh, on factory politics, um, what you see happening is that um, they make a, a distinction between the left parties and the right parties. And uh, the left parties, they accuse the right parties to make use of emotions in, uh, in politics. Uh, and they assume that they only uh, build their own stories on facts. Uh, and I think that is not entirely true. Um, what I see happening is that both uh, sides of the, of the spectrum, they both use it. And I think it's better to acknowledge that you do so than that you only accuse uh, the opponent uh, uh, to, to, to make use of this. Um, and this statement uh, is made by three uh, political scientists. And I think this really shows that emotions are valid in, uh, in, in politics. If you are uh, left-minded or right-minded, emotions are there and they form and they uh, construct your own belief system. So I think it's important for all parties not to deny that also their own uh, policies is based on emotions. So my thesis is that emotions matter in politics, and I have uh, three reasons uh, for doing so. Uh, first of all, politics, it is for the people. So uh, politicians, uh, they represent people. So once every four years, they are given a mandate to make decisions on their behalf, and that have far reaching consequences for the country, but also for the daily lives of the people they represent. So politicians, uh, they represent people, and as we saw in the previous slide, people are also guided by emotions in their ideals and interests. So I think when you want to represent people, you also need to, uh, yeah, to acknowledge their emotions. Secondly, uh, politics is a battle of ideas, and that is not the same as a battle for truth. So I started my story with this observation already. Ideas are uh, normative. So maximizing rents is a logical or desirable idea for someone, while for other people, it is an unnecessary intervention in the mechanisms of the market. This is, such, this is only one example, but there are more examples. Um, for example, wanting to hold on to the current holidays. It can be very logic for one person, but for the other one, it can be very logic uh, to be free during the end of the Ramadan or during Hanukkah. So from their representative function, politicians express themselves in a debate in a way that suits the dominant, the dominant norms of their constituencies. And it goes even further. Politicians, they determine which norms and values are to be incorporated into policy and into legislation. So norms and values are incorporated into legislation. So it's not only an expression, it's even uh, a real impact. Thirdly, and this point is in line with Nussbaum, um, empathy is very important in politics. Uh, I even dare to say that more empathy can uh, lead to better performing of, uh, of policies. Uh, I truly believe that a responsive government is also an effective government uh, and policy is made for people. So the better it connects to their experiences, the greater the impact on policy will be. Many good intentions turn out to be counterproductive in practice. That is also what we have seen. Um, even in the 19th century already, uh, thinkers like the Tocqueville and Spencer, they talked about this. And later on in the 40s, uh, a thinker as, as Merton, he stated the same. But also in, uh, yeah, in, in current uh, life, you see a lot of affairs and examples. Um, I'll just uh, point at one, it's the healthcare system. What you see is that the Healthcare Insurance Act tries to ensure that health um, insurance companies pay out money to the care providers that, uh, that, took, um, that provided care. Uh, and this care is supposed to make people better. Right, But wouldn't it be smarter if they prevent people from getting sick? So what I don't understand in the healthcare uh, system, as we are having it right now, is that the system only allow reimbursement for providing, uh, for providing healthcare and not for providing preventive measures. 
I think it is an unintended uh, good idea. And I think when we turn this around, healthcare can be uh, improved, but there is a reason why it's still not the situation. Okay, um, I try to avoid the impression uh, that emotions are more important than facts because I talk a lot about emotions now, um, but I also truly believe that facts and knowledge and scientific insights do help in politics. Uh, science uh, and, and scientific uh, insights, they matter. Um, and again, I want to give you some examples why but actually I do think this is a no brainer for you <laughs> because you are a scientist yourself. So I think this is uh, something that is uh, very um, uh, similar to your own ideas. Uh, first, uh, well-informed politicians, they make informed choices. Um, so information uh, leads uh, to insights into what works and what doesn't work. So what are the effects on the economy, on the employment, on the environment, on social relations? Um, and that's exactly why I wanted to work for that lobby firm, because what I wanted to do, I wanted to make sure that politicians receive the information of uh, interest groups. And I, what I wanted is that those politicians, that they knew all the perspectives so they could make a well-formed decision what they thought this is the best perspective to choose. And uh, secondly, uh, new scientific insights, they lead, of course, to improve policies. Um, as an example, uh, take the alcohol uh, policy. Um, we have more and more insights on the effects on, from alcohol uh, to uh, the growing brain. And these insights have contributed to an increase in the age limit of purchasing alcohol. Yet in practice, we see that political views can cause science and policy to grind to a halt. For an example, uh, psychedelics. Years and years ago, in the 70s, uh, we used psychedelics to cure people with de depression, uh, but also with trauma. And science proved that this was very effective to do. But because of the taboo on drugs, therapists are no longer allowed to make use of them, but there are very positive scientific results, sometimes even more positive uh, than the medication of the pharma industry. So sometimes there are scientific insights, but we cannot use it because of political taboos. And uh, thirdly, uh, why I think uh, facts and knowledge matter in politics is that it can be a bridge to help if there is uh, too much of uh, yeah, polarization within politics. A third party can bridge a gap. Take all the advisory boards. We have a lot in the Netherlands. We have a lot of planning bureaus. We have uh, the Socioeconomic Council. We have the Scientific Advisory Board for Government. And all those insights they provide, uh, they can lead to, yeah, to advice for government uh, to convince parties to move up to different political positions than what they were, uh, were having now. Okay, now I want to uh, go into two cases um, because I'm also interested uh, in where you stand, of course. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna uh, present uh, two very actual problems. Uh, one is climate change and the other one is fighting uh, the COVID crisis. And uh, first, well, I introduced the cases and then we used the Mentimeter um, yeah, to, to show how you would deal in these kind of situations. So first, uh, climate change. Um, yeah, we all know, of course, a lot about the topic, I assume. Um, and what we do see is that facts are uh, yeah, very important into this political debate. Uh, less cabinet, or it's still the cabinet we're having, as long as there is not a new one formed. Uh, but it stated it was the greenest uh, coalition ever. And in cooperation with NGOs and the industry and the unions, uh, they made a deal to achieve climate uh, agreements uh, or climate objectives. Uh, and those objectives uh, was all about facts and figures and percentages and so forth. An influential authority is, of course, also the IPCC in this debate, the International Panel for Climate Change. 
and 98% of the scientists, they agree that it's extremely likely that humans are a dominant factor in global warming. And this consensus in, in science is also uh, visible in the political debates. There are only two populistic right-wing parties in the Netherlands uh, who do not go along with this, the, the Freedom Party and the Forum for Democracy uh, Party. Uh, and although there is consensus in politics, uh, there are big differences in the way how to fight climate change. So how fast should it be done? Uh, where should the reduction be achieved? Are those the farmers or the industry or the air traffic uh, or, or, or the consumers? So there is a lot of discontent when it comes to, uh, to the where question, but also, of course, who pays the bill? I think uh, it's always a discussion, but uh, also in the Netherlands, uh, are those the businesses, the consumers or the government who needs to pay the bill uh, to fight climate change? And uh, yeah, again, there are big uh, differences. Um, the, the, the parties who really want to take big steps, they are called the pushers uh, by the people who are more moderate. Uh, and yeah, these so-called pushers, uh, they call the others uh, deniers. Um, so uh, there is a lot of uh, consensus within politics. Still, uh, they show a lot of uh, polarization. Um, so, if the political debate fails, then sometimes outside pressure, they can make change. So the many demonstrations we have seen uh, last years, they put the urgency of the issue on the agenda. So I think the social movements around climate change, uh, that they are all uh, doing an, uh, an, an effort to fuel the emotions. But we also see another trend uh, that there are breakthroughs based on numbers and statistics and facts. Uh, and uh, the measure to do so are lawsuits. I think a week ago or two weeks ago, a very important lawsuit was won by the green NGO, Milieu Defensie. Uh, they accused Shell uh, not to, to move forward or not uh, quick enough. And uh, the, uh, the court, they proved them re were right. So that was a very massive uh, lawsuit in the Netherlands that can lead to change. And this was not the first time. Also the Urgenda um, lawsuit of years ago, it was against the state. It was also won uh, by the green NGOs, but also think of the uh, nitrogen uh, rulings, the, the stickstoff uh, crisis that is also caused by, by lawsuits. Um, and those lawsuits are all won because of facts and figures. So when it comes to climate change, uh, science plays a very important role. And solutions are sought in innovations and in, uh, in R&D, in research and development. For some parties, that is the reason not to want a major system change. They say modern techniques, they will solve the problems by themselves. And it's, it's right, there are so many techniques nowadays available or under development. Think of the power of windmills. Uh, it is always increasing and increasing. Think of solar panels. They are bigger and bigger. Think of uh, CCS. It's a carbon and capture storage. So how can you put uh, CO2 under the ground? Think of hydrogen, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen. Think of uh, geothermal. So the techniques are there. They are evolving. The problem that we're facing right now is that people do not want to have those technique when it's in their own uh, in their own space where they where they live. Think of the windmills. People don't want to have them in their backyard. Uh, but think of uh, the storage of, uh, of of CO2 under the ground. People don't want to have that if they are living uh, above it, or they want to they don't want to see it in the North Sea. So. It is very difficult uh, to find uh, breakthroughs. And now I'm very, very curious uh, where you stand in this. So what I try to do, we can all go uh, to, to internet to send uh, the, the Mentimeter up. It's mentimeter.com and you can use the code. It's here, I, I can see it myself, <laughs> 6337, ah, here I see it, 2264. So I give you some time to, to log in. 
because I'm really curious uh, if you are the prime minister yourself, how you would deal uh, with the information you have and the interest you, you want to serve. Okay, there are uh, in the Mentimeter uh, three different options. Uh, the first technique uh, that is there is nuclear energy. energy. Uh, there is a big debate on it. It was one of the topics uh, in the election debates uh, of March. Um, and at, at one hand, the, the, the people who are supporters of this, they state that it is the way uh, forward. Well, the opponents, they say it's very costly, it's time consuming and it's unsafe. So this is one option. The other option are the wind turbines I talked about. Uh, they are very effective and they're very clean, uh, but people don't want to have them in their backyard. And the CCS, uh, it's the storage uh, under the ground. Um, here, it's yeah, is a lot of debate because it's not the solution because still the industry is polluting. Um, so it's not a clean way how to produce uh, products, for example. Um, so it is a temporary measure but it's very, very costly. So this can only work if the industry itself is subsidized. So what I want to know, and I'm going to switch to my other screen, uh, is what you would do if you have to choose between those three options, uh, where would you put your money? Okay, can you see it? Interesting. Very interesting. Um, it is clear that the majority of you would put the most money. No, it's not clear. It's, it's still changing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, OK. There, there is a battle going on between the wind turbines and the, and the CCS. Nuclear power is not that powerful in this group. Um, but actually, I think there is not a big, big difference between the three, uh, the three techniques. And why I want to show this to you is to show that there are so many interests you need to take in com into consideration. And um, it's not only about the technique itself, but also uh, the interests that are uh, behind it. Um, and it's important to 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 yeah to take notice of the fact that there are two now uh, yeah with the same uh, end result. So it's not easy to come up with a solution that can make everyone uh, happy and uh, and supportive. I think climate uh, fa facing climate change. Uh, is super important uh, to see how science can be of help. Um, first of all, uh, insights into short and, uh, and long-term effects can help to make those decisions. Um, first, uh, we've seen that there are uh, long-term interests in nuclear power, for example, but there are also uh, short-term uh, 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 interests at risks. So what I do hope is that um, scientists uh, can show politicians what the short-term and the long-term effects are for policy so they can make well-informed decisions. But at the same time, a difficulty in politics is that politics is only uh, led uh, by a horizon of four years. Um, so you see this again in the whole debate on the, the global warming of uh, 1.5 uh, degrees. How, how can we uh, not cross that, um, uh, th that line? Um, there are no uh, policies made so far uh, that will take the, that 10 years into consideration. Um, so I think sometimes there is more needed uh, to convince politics than just uh, the insights in risks. What is also very important uh, are the, the, the role of the planning agencies, uh, because they can provide insights in what the political parties actually uh, do. 
because all the political parties, they write their own program down into beautiful election uh, manifestos. And those are strong words mostly. Um, but the, the calculations of the plan bureaus of those election programs, they actually show uh, how, they, um, how they spend their money, for example. Um, so there you can really see, do they put their money where their mouth is? Uh, what was very interesting in the uh, in the uh, last elections was that the, the Liberal Party they didn't want to uh, to make those calculations for the climate uh, effects of their program, uh, so that was a reason for me and for my colleagues uh, to to pick this up because we thought it is important that the biggest political party also shows what they do on the biggest uh, problem yeah nowadays. Uh, so we asked uh, one of uh, the, the, yeah, the well-known uh, bureaus uh, to do this calculation. And indeed, the, the Liberal Party, they didn't reach the goals uh, they talked about. Um, so I think it's very valuable uh, also for, for voters to know uh, what people really do. Um, and thirdly, uh, information can ensure that resistance is, uh, is removed. Uh, sometimes there is a lot of resistance uh, by certain measures, as I showed you before. And as a politician, uh, you should take these uh, emotions and this resistance seriously. Uh, at the same time, uh, it can help politicians to show to those people uh, what the facts are. Uh, so, but it's not only convincing the people by facts, but it's also important that the politicians uh, that they act on it. So the, the wind turbines, uh, they, they make a lot of noise. So here in Amsterdam, uh, there was a lot of fuss in Eiberg because the windmills were too close uh, situated, too closely situated to the, uh, to the people uh, living there. So I think it's also needed for politicians to really uh, take the interests into account and then facts, they do help. Okay, then there is uh, the second case. Uh, it's the, the COVID crisis. And um, I think this was very important, uh, what happened here when it comes to uh, science in politics. Um, as we all know, is that the pandemic uh, was very unexpected uh, and we also knew not so much. And that is an understatement. Um, so in one of the first uh, press conferences, uh, Mark Rutte, the prime minister, he put it very spot on, if you ask me. He said, uh, with 50% knowledge, we must take 100% uh, decisions. And uh, another statement he made was, we are navigating in the light of the headlights. So in other words, there was a lot of ignorance, uh, but action had to be uh, taken. And the way how the cabinet dealt uh, with this was to put together an advisory board of experts uh, this was the so-called uh, outbreak management team. And uh, based on the latest figures, they gave advice to the cabinet and the ministers indicated that they usually followed this advice and they still do. Uh, this outbreak management team mainly consisted of experts with knowledge of safety and of health. And after a few months, criticism arose from politicians and from uh, society because um, this was... Uh, too, too, this was too, too much one side of the view. Other experts had to uh, contribute too uh, to the political debate and decision making because the crisis was not only a health and safety issue. The crisis was also an economic crisis and the crisis was also a social crisis. So later on, uh, economists, sociologists and psychologists, they also had a say into uh, the political debate. And in the beginning, uh, the cabinet was super unified, uh, but later on within the cabinet itself, you saw the same division, uh, that the same division took place. Uh, there was the minister of finance and the minister of social affairs. And they stated that there was more to take into consideration than only healthcare. Uh, so they also, uh, they, they really did their best to put financial and economic interests uh, at stake, and um, of course, uh, social uh, affairs. So I think it's super interesting in this crisis that you see how important uh, science was, uh, 
but also how difficult it is uh, to come up with one clear approach uh, to solve the problems and to lead the country uh, through this crisis, uh, while there are so many uh, perspectives involved. So again, I'm curious uh, what you would do if you were the prime minister. So there are three crises at the same time, and there's only one approach you can choose from. Do you choose the strict lockdown? And then you really, uh, yeah, for you, the, the health crisis is the most uh, important. Or is the economic crisis more important than health? And do you give more freedom uh, to run businesses? Or the third option is that uh, the social crisis is uh, the most important for you. If this is the case, then you want to give more freedom for social contacts. So think of uh, yeah, the, the curfew, for example, you will cancel the curfew. Uh, or you put more uh, people together in a room, you, you allow more people. Um, so I'm curious what you would do if you are the prime minister. So again, uh, we go to the Mentimeter. Yeah, here it is. I think it's the same number. Um, and the question now is, where do you put your focus? The least and the most. Is it health? Is it the economy or is it uh, social well-being? And social well-being is also mental well-being, of course. Is it working? Because I don't mm -hmm. see. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think yeah. it, you have to change the slide. Ah. Um, and do you know uh, what I should do exactly? I think if you click present at the top right, it should, yeah. the top right, I think it should work. Yeah. Does it work now? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Let's see if there are still moving targets or this is it. It's funny that it started really clear with a lot of focus on health, but now it's all come, uh, it's coming together. Yeah, and actually, I, I do think this is uh, more or less uh, similar to what is the actual policy uh, right now. So I do think that still health is the number one perspective that they take into account. Um, maybe, it, yeah, there, there's more um, emphasis on the economic uh, interests uh, nowadays. And here in this group, this is uh, number three. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's, it's not so, uh, so different. But what I do hope is that this kind of, uh, yeah, little, um, yeah, this, this uh, what you call it, these little cases that they uh, help to start how it is to be a politician and to take all those perspectives uh, into consideration. So again, um, yeah, I want to explain why science uh, is uh, of support also in the fighting the COVID uh, crisis. Um, and I think it's really clear how the outbreak management team really helped government uh, to make uh, very, very complicated uh, decisions. Uh, it really helped them to act on political dilemmas. Um, and I also hope that's the second point that uh, the different disciplines that they uh, were all combined there. 
and in the beginning it wasn't and later on we have seen that there are also other uh, perspectives and other disciplines uh, that uh, we're taking into consideration um, very important uh, in this case is that data and insights can contribute also in finding support for taking measures uh, figures on the number of infections and admissions uh, to intensive care uh, they were all published and that had uh, to lead to uh, feelings of urgency uh, in, in society um, and eventually uh, it led to uh, support for for specific measures um, for example the mouth uh, masks in the beginning everyone was very reluctant uh, to wear them especially in the netherlands in other countries everyone was using the mouth masks uh, already um, and then there was more and more research uh, published on yeah that there can be an effect uh, so it's uh, very late, uh, the Netherlands introduced this as a policy measure, and I think uh, we all are more or less um, uh, yeah, used to it now. Um, so I come uh, to the end of my uh, lecture. Um, I told you in the beginning what my three main messages uh, were. And I do think that those main messages, uh, that they can lead to a statement uh, to talk about further uh, with each other. Um, but first, I will repeat my uh, three main messages. Uh, one was that science and politics are less different as you might think. Two, emotions and opinions matter in politics. It's important for representation, for norms and empathy in policy making. And three, science can be of support in decision making, but cannot be the leading indicator in political decision making. Um, so to conclude with my statement, uh, my statement is that, um, yeah, we are forming a cabinet right now, of course, and as you all know, is that uh, there is an impasse. Uh, we don't know how to solve this. Uh, so the more and more you hear people say, shouldn't we introduce a nonpartisan cabinet, so a Zaka cabinet. Um, so the, the ministers in the cabinet are just professionals, they're experts, and they are not coming from uh, political parties. Uh, let Mark Rutte put together a cabinet of professionals. I think this is a really bad idea. A country should be covered, governed on the basis of knowledge, but also on the basis of political interests and even with a healthy dose of emotion. So I'm very curious also uh, what you think and what the panelists uh, think of this uh, idea. And I hope uh, I could have uh, convinced you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Norge Tyson, and uh, also for the kickoff for, uh, I think, Q&A or maybe even a discussion or something, uh, a combination of a Q&A uh, and discussion. <clears throat> I was asked to, uh, to moderate this uh, second part, but um, in our... Um, in our talk we had uh, five minutes before, uh, we also agreed upon a, a very short um, coffee break. Um, I think the uh, idea was two minutes, let's make it three minutes, uh, so everybody has uh, really time to, to take some coffee. Uh, so um, let's have a short break in three minutes, that means uh, we will start at 17.12, 17.12, 12 minutes past, uh, past five. Yes, thank you.
So this 12 minutes past five works very well. Everybody is uh, back exactly on uh, time. Um, my name is Boris Slapper, and uh, I was asked again to, uh, to moderate what uh, could be a Q&A, but also a bit of a uh, discussion. Um, we will do that um, with uh, the panel uh, members, say the, pan the people present here in the, uh, in the Zoom that you can all see, but also with the attendees, people outside. Uh, they, you can put your questions in um, the Q&A, and I will collect them and try to moderate as, uh, as good as I can. And um, Chaklar, I think um, we already discussed the idea that uh, you could uh, kick off with your uh, first questions uh, to Norcia or perhaps your comments on uh, what she okay. just, just said. All right. Thanks, Boris. Uh, well, many thanks, Norcia, for this very comprehensive and insightful uh, talk. I find it really stimulating intellectually, uh, and I'm sure that PPE students will find this very inspiring, uh, so forth. Thanks for that. Um, I think my question, so, I mean, one uh, one thing that struck me is that we as academics who are broadly interested in, you know, theories of democracy, um, subjects of PPE, we also struggle with similar kinds of questions. So that was uh, uh, kind of, good news i guess uh, for us as you know uh, philosophers or those who think that we are far away from you know the realities of politics so that's very uh, i think interesting and stimulating um so my question is more about the kind of puzzle that you also end with um so you described nicely that on the one hand, you, uh, 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 as someone or uh, people in the scientific bureau, are uh, as people who you know respect science and evidence, um, um, they also face this challenge that you know facts are not really sexy. You know they don't work. Uh, people don't really. Um, uh, respond to facts and you know scientific you know, uh, uh, available evidence in the way that maybe scientific bureau may want um, and this leaves someone uh, you know if, if I would work there I would be also puzzled when I come across with a piece of evidence that kind of contradicts with the benefits or you know the policy agenda of the party so I'm wondering what is the kind of strategy you have uh, in you know, dealing with those cases where you know facts are not really working in the way that you want, but you also don't want to do Trump-like politics. So that's one question. The second question I have is: um, so as the you know theoreticians, um, I think many people have also ideas that may be far removed from the reality, but can be inspiring in real life politics. So one of the many, many uh, very prominent and popular idea among, I think, economists and politics, uh, politicians, theory, uh, people working in this field is the idea of deliberative democracy. So they say that uh, maybe policymakers uh, and scientists should engage with citizen, citizens more so deepening the practices of democracy in such a way that citizens are also involved in uh, the making of the policy agendas and you know understanding what's going on, and this could you know change the perspective of the people, you know change their preferences in such a way that you know maybe. Uh, 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 otherwise, it may not work. Like you, you could introduce. Uh, you know, pieces of evidence, but it doesn't really change anything in people's minds. But if you let, you know, people engage with each other and maybe participate in the making of some of the knowledge that may be relevant for them, they may be, yeah, they may also change their preferences in other regarding ways. Uh, so that's, let's say, a theoretical hope that many people in political science or you know, economics uh, may be holding. So I'm wondering uh, what your stance towards 
to this kind of idealistic vision of you know, more deliberative democracy. Okay, thank you very much, Saklar. So I'm not sure what if science doesn't work for your political agenda and would the more deliberative democracy actually help? Thank you so much. Super interesting uh, to hear your questions. And uh, also thank you uh, that you liked the story and it was uh, an inspiration for you. That was uh, one of my uh, purposes, of course. Um, yeah, good questions. Uh, I start with the first one because you are right. We don't want to be Trump. <laughs> it would be uh, news, I guess, if uh, the Scientific Bureau of GroenLinks uh, yeah, is... Uh, uh, not so keen on facts. Um, I think uh, that is not uh, what, what we want and what we uh, pursued. Um, so uh, to answer your question, um, I think what really helps us is that uh, mostly the selection of the projects, um, we, we, uh, I think there is a self-selection uh, because the, the projects what we are interested in um, are are about the ideals we believe in. So for example, um, we did a big project on the, uh, on the transformation of the industry uh, because, uh, and that was interesting for the scientific bureau because normally um, there are a lot of supporters within the party and they really believe that we can live without the industry. Uh, they say, let's uh, cancel uh, Shell tomorrow and we have a better place to live in. Uh, well, what we did with this project, we showed that we need Shell. We need Shell to make that transition because Shell has the money, Shell has the knowledge, uh, and we are still too dependent on the products uh, Shell is using, and uh, not only in our cars, but also uh, in, in, a wind, uh, in a windmill, for example. When you produce a windmill, there is, there is plastic and aluminium. Um, and so that is made uh, plastic with oil. So um, what we did, uh, we made use of what we know about how an energy transition can take place and how uh, the industry should play a role in that. Um, and this was a total different story than uh, a lot of green people always uh, articulate. Um, so we choose the, the projects where we believe in, and yeah, then uh, mostly uh, the facts are also at your side. But sometimes it's more difficult because I do understand where your question is coming from. Another project uh, we are conducting now, it's about uh, scarcity in energy, uh, in, in, in products. So more in the, uh, in the uh, how do you call it? The, the, the grondstoffen, the commodities. Uh, to, uh, to produce, for example, uh, an electric car, an electric vehicle, you need to make use of cobalt, and cobalt is scarce. Uh, so this is, for the Green Party, a big problem, because at one hand, uh, we need all those metals. At the other hand, um, this is not sustainable. Uh, so here, we make use of science and scientific perspective, how to solve this dilemma. Um, and um, we are really open what the scientists uh, tell us because we really believe that their insights can help us uh, to, to come up with a breakthrough. So um, this is another example. Um, actually, I don't have an example where uh, we found something that is really uh, contradicting uh, to what we believe in. Um, but I think that has something to do with that self-selection uh, mechanism. Um, but when we will face it, uh, I will think of you. <laughs> and I think, yeah, indeed, uh, he had a valid point there that, uh, yeah, we have to deal with it. And actually, I don't, just, I don't know how we would do that. Um, the other point was a lot about uh, deliberatively uh, democracy. Um, I really think this is the key for a lot of uh, problems uh, that the Green Party uh, is facing at the moment. Uh, we talked about all the techniques that are available um, for the energy transition. And at the same time, there is not so much a support uh, yeah, to, to implement all those techniques because it has an effect on the daily lives of people. Um, there is, of course, this phenomenon, uh, yeah, the councils uh, with, uh, with, with people, the, the Burgerraden, uh, how we call it in, uh, in the Netherlands. 
And I think this is uh, the way uh, to go uh, to, to, to go uh, into the next step uh, when it comes to policy making, because right now uh, there are a lot of um, uh, consultations, uh, so people can address their problems, but those are consultations in the process that that is already yeah it's already in the development phase so then it's it's not more than yeah we we listen to you and thank you uh, well this kind of uh, fora uh, really uh, yeah contribute uh, yeah they make um, of course use of the of the voices of the people in uh, the creative phase so not in the development phase but in the whole idea where should we put a windmill and not if we put the windmill here, what is your idea uh, about it? And uh, yeah, this is very effective, uh, as we know. But there's also a lot of research uh, on this. The problem is that it takes a lot of time. It's super time consuming. Um, so if you uh, want to make use of this, uh, you need to start early. Uh, so this is also our message to uh, policymakers, because this is uh, one of the things we advise uh, also to the, the politicians. Um, so start early and then later on, you have uh, a lot of time saved because there is uh, less resistance. Um, so it's an investment, but uh, do it proper and do it right. Yeah, so I think it's uh, you are right and it's a suggestion. Uh, I hope that not only the Green Party uh, will look at, but all the decision makers and policy makers. Thank you very much. Uh, fortunately, I also see a question in the Q&A from our attendees, but um, I will, would like to first give uh, the floor to, to Roland uh, Luttens, who was uh, first to raise his hand to ask a question from, uh, from the panel. Roland. Thank you, Boris, and uh, thank you, Dr. Thaisen, for a very interesting and thought-provoking uh, lecture. Um, can science and politics uh, go hand in hand and be friends? I mean, you have said that politics is a battle of ideas. It's not a battle for truth. So that is rather skeptical if we think that science is a battle for truth. Um, yet, as, of course, organizers of a PPE program, we do hope that science and uh, politics and policy can go hand in hand and reinforce each other um, and that is what my question is about. We are celebrating today five years of PPE. And for our students um, who are listening and tuning in here, um, you are the, the, the leader of the, of, the, um, of the scientific bureau. So I guess you are also in charge of recruitment. Um, I wanted to ask, I mean, if we talk about science, my feeling during your talk was that we are a lot talking about, like, let's say, hard sciences, specific information on health or on uh, pollution and so on. But of course, PPE is, um, is not, not these hard sciences. It's, it's, it's truly a social science. And my question to you is, um, well-educated people, uh, students, PPE students, um, how can they contribute, in your opinion, to... Uh, the work that you do and to, to the, the policies that, that, that you devise. And let me maybe give one example because, I mean, we're facing the health crisis and um, it was clear, as you said, that we are in a situation of uh, massive uncertainty. And I think, I think an, 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 a well-educated uh, student uh, in PPE will immediately say, for example, will take inspiration uh, from the work of John Rawls and say that uh, given that we are with so much information, uh, sorry, such a lack of information, so much uncertainty, that we are behind some veil of ignorance and um, the best thing to do is then maybe to, you know, uh, minimize the, the, the worst of situation and, and maybe flattening the curve uh, was exactly doing that. Um, so, in that regard, so my question, I guess, to you is, um, can you kind of testify or give your uh, opinion about the added value that a well-rounded social scientist in both uh, politics, philosophy, and economics can contribute, let's say, to the work you are doing? OK. Yeah. So not, not the virologists? And that's uh, the physicists. No, 
I have good news uh, to share <laughs> because um, uh, in the scientific bureau itself, uh, the people who are working there are mostly social scientists um, uh, or also the people who used to work there. Um, we have, uh, yeah, I'm a sociologist, uh, there are political scientists, uh, philosophers, um, and we do value these kind of uh, disciplines uh, because we are not looking uh, for the, the truth, the, the hard uh, science. What we do is we make a translation of what we see happening in the world. And the world can be uh, the world of science, but it can also be uh, the world of uh, the businesses or the NGOs. And what we do, we make a translation of uh, what we find there. Uh, so we can make use of it in our uh, green and left uh, political thinking. So the competencies that are needed uh, in the jobs we are offering, uh, it is about critical thinking, it's about polemic writing, uh, it's about uh, uh, yeah, constructing argumentations and debates. So um, that is, I think, uh, a positive answer to your question, is that we really value uh, this kind of uh, yeah, disciplines and, um, and skills. And this is what we are looking for. Uh, what is the most important uh, for us is that uh, people uh, have a political uh, sensitiveness. Um, and this is also something uh, you cannot pinpoint, you cannot uh, see this uh, in, or you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, just calculate it. It is uh, something that has everything to do with your own interests. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, to answer your question, a social, uh, social, social science is super, super important in the whole political domain. Um, if you also take a look uh, in the, uh, in the uh, composition of the parliament, um, I think, I, I don't know, but I do think there are a lot of uh, social scientists uh, too. Sometimes it's a complaint. Uh, people say there are, is uh, not uh, so many people who know uh, a lot about the math, or uh, or yeah, there are not enough uh, legal uh, a, a law, a lawyers, for example. Uh, well, they need to control uh, if the law is uh, yeah is, is implemented in a way uh, that that is intended. Um, so I think there is hope for sociologists that, it's, that such as me and also uh, PPE students uh, like you uh, to, to work in a field like this. And it's uh, of much value. And uh, in the COVID crisis case, uh, we've seen how uh, yeah, this perspective really, contrib really contributed to the political debate. So we have a lot uh, to bring there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, before we, I would like to uh, to answer the questions in the the question in the Q and A uh, chat by our attendees. But um, first, we go to uh, my colleague uh, Marina Uzunova. Thanks, Boris. But I think actually Tun's question might be a better follow up here, so I could wait a little bit because it's okay. a new one. It's a new one. Okay. Uh, so then we go to uh, the question by Dukoning. Um, TM the Koning in the chat. Um, a question to Dr. Tyson. Uh, there's a lot of critique on the influence of lobbyists in politics and the lack of independent research in parliament, uh, research parliament, parliamentarians, sorry, can actually do uh, due to their small staff. Uh, topical issue, I think it has been discussed over the last weeks in Dutch news as well. Having uh, been on both sides of this balance, what is your opinion on this? So the, the lack of um, uh, possibilities for parliamentarians to do independent uh, research? It's a really good question and totally valid. Um, it, it, it's, it's right. I think in the Netherlands, we are very skimpy uh, when it comes to investing in democracy. Uh, yeah, we are a frugal country. And I think uh, this is uh, visible in the way how politics is organized. Uh, there's a lot of research done and then you see that indeed the politicians don't have a lot of support uh, of, of policy advisors. Um, and if you see the difference between the ministers uh, with their big ministries uh, with, uh, with, with full of employers 
uh, employees, thousands of them, and you see uh, a politician who needs to control what the minister is doing with only one or two uh, policy advisors that can help. Uh, there is a big, big disbalance, and that is uh, very risky in the balance between uh, yeah, power and control. So uh, yeah, it's a hot topic uh, in the political debate at the moment, of course. And yeah, you're right. I've been um, into, yeah, I, I know the two sides of the table. Um, I always worked for a relatively small political party, uh, but when we were having 10 seats in parliament, I was having some time uh, to, yeah, to pick up my own initiatives uh, and to really read all the reports. Um, and when I say I really read all the reports, and I'm afraid I also need to disappoint all of you a bit because that is mainly the summary, the introduction and the conclusion. Um, because there is uh, not a lot of time, but uh, when we uh, were reduced into four seats in parliament, I didn't have any time anymore uh, to even read uh, yeah, only the introduction, the conclusions and the summary of a report. And then I found out uh, how much I was dependent on the information that lobbyists uh, were giving to me. Um, so that is, uh, that is vulnerable uh, for the political system. Um, and at the same time, those lobbyists, they were my lifesavers because without them, uh, I couldn't do my job. Uh, so what I also found out was that there were really good lobbyists and really bad lobbyists. And the, the bad lobbyists who didn't provide me uh, with uh, the right information or they, you know, it, sometimes they can be, um, they don't show the, the broader perspective and tell you, so this is the world and this is our position, but they only push their own position and they pretend that the rest of the world is not existing. This kind of information uh, that doesn't feel good uh, to use uh, in politics itself. So I was really selective in who I want to work with. Um, and for me, this was an incentive uh, to take that step, what some people say, to the dark side of, of the lobbying world, uh, because what I really wanted to do is contribute uh, to the quality of, uh, yeah, of that dynamic between lobbyists and, and politicians. I really do believe in the, uh, yeah, in the, in the positive effects uh, when this relation between them is it's healthy, it's based on information and it's transparent, um, but then the information should be uh, of high quality. And that was for me a reason uh, to take that step uh, because I do see how vulnerable it is in the Netherlands. Okay. Thank you, it was a very short follow-up on this. You could um, of course think that the uh, scientific bureau could perform this function uh, for, uh, for GroenLinks, but um, one of your predecessors once told me that you are the only paid employment of uh, the, the scientific bureau. Is that correct? Me? Yeah. Oh, no, no, oh, okay. we are all uh, paid, no. Okay, that's good, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that, this was of another party? Of the... No, 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 this was also Wetenschappelijk Bureau of GroenLinks. Oh, no. But when I was dreaming of applying for a job there, I said, there's, there's only a director, and that's it. But oh, no, obviously. you can you can apply and, uh, okay, and I will pay you. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. I'll, I'll reconsider yeah. it. Yeah, um, we have only one uh, volunteer and one okay. uh, fellow uh, who is active uh, in our bureau and the rest is all uh, paid, uh, paid people. Um, but what was the question? Oh, that was that was not the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> the question was how many people work at the yeah. uh, scientific bureau. Um, there's one uh, question from a PPE student in our panel. That's uh, Elias. Elias, can I give you the? If you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was Marina's turn now, but maybe I. Uh... Yeah, but but Marina is is going to be after you. Okay. Okay. Um, I was wondering, uh, of course, thank you for your uh, talk. It was very interesting to hear uh, your point of view, uh, especially with regards to the uh, Zaken cabinet. Uh, and I was wondering, um, so you are not in favor of, of it, but um, do you see maybe the um, advantages of, uh, for example, uh, a Zaken cabinet or, or no, normal, uh, normal uh, cabinet, which would have uh, ministers that do have a certain expertise. Um, so for example, 
a general who votes VVD, who becomes uh, Minister of Defense, uh, or a doctor who votes CDA, who um, doesn't need to be explained uh, why the IC is, uh, uh, the intensive care is uh, important uh, with, with regards to a pandemic, for example. So, so that you have a higher level of, of um, yeah, uh, now hoger instap niveau, I mean. <laughs> Uh, and then you can make also better decisions as a, a being a, a being a, a minister because now you see, uh, for example, there's one minister I think from the VVD who jumped from education to law uh, from one year to the other, and you know for certain that when he started at the ju the judiciary uh, department he didn't know anything about it. Um, so yeah, I, I do you see those possible advantages and would you be favor of uh, a Zaken cabinet light, so to say. Okay. Uh, I think in the end, uh, we all need uh, ministers who are motivated uh, to do their job. And I think you are not only motivated uh, by, uh, yeah, by, by the salary or by the, the, the reputation, but also by the content, what, what you can do. Um, what I do see is that mostly politicians and uh, ministers, uh, they, are very, they are idealists. They want to have the job because they want to change the world or they want to contribute to a better place. Um, yeah, so I think all the ministers uh, should have that driver uh, to do this job as, as good as they can. Um, and by doing so, they can do a better job. Um, so I think, yeah, sometimes you do see that uh, there are ministers and they lack uh, knowledge. Uh, for example, uh, Bas van het Wout, he was uh, one of the politicians for the liberals, just an MP. And then uh, there was a burnout. So he took over uh, the, the minister uh, position of, or this was not the burnout, this was Eric Wiebes because of the child uh, allowance affair. So uh, Wiebes withdrew, and then Bas van het Wout took over. But he didn't know anything about those topics. And the responsibilities were huge. So what happened after a few months, he was burned out. Um, and I think uh, when you don't have enough knowledge, uh, only, uh, yeah, your driver, how, yeah, even if it's so uh, sincere, uh, when you are driven because you want to make the world a better place, but you don't have the knowledge, uh, you cannot make it because it is, uh, it is uh, a very responsible job and you need to know a lot. Uh, at the same time, uh, ministers are uh, advised by, uh, by uh, civil servants. And they have a lot of civil servants. Uh, but sometimes uh, what, is, what I think is a bit risky uh, is that a minister is too dependent on the civil servants and that the civil servants who are not elected, uh, that they uh, are having too much power uh, to shape uh, the policies and by then uh, the world. Um, so I think I, I totally agree with you. Uh, a minister should have enough knowledge uh, to, to do that job. Uh, a minister doesn't need to necessarily need to be an expert itself, uh, but there is, yeah, there, there, there is a basic knowledge of the, of the field that you want to do. Um, and if you are not having that, yeah, I think you don't make it. Yeah, we've seen it happening. Then you end up like Bas van Wout. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Yeah, and there are other uh, ministers who are just not so effective, and those are the ones who need to defend their policy every week in parliament because uh, the politicians they do their job. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And um, now finally, I can uh, allow Marino Zanova to uh, to ask a question. Marino. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I'm starting a bit of a new subject. Um, I was curious to hear a bit more about the role of emotion and the kind of emotion that uh, you were speaking about, because it's normally when you speak about emotions in politics, it's a bit of a dangerous concept, depending on where it's coming from and where it's directed. Um, it seems to be productive if it's kind of bottom up, like in the progressive movements of the 60s. 
uh, or the the protests recently but if it, if it's top down like in populist movements then it could be a bit dangerous um so i wonder who how much emotion who is who you think should ideally be the subject um, uh, and uh, yeah a bit more perhaps about that be great yeah yeah, I think, yeah, you're also right in a way that um, it is important to know where the emotions are coming from. Um, and yeah, they are the, the grassroots uh, emotions. Uh, and yeah, actually, I, I think not, it, it really depends on what your own perspective is, if, if the grassroots emotions are better than other emotions. Um, I think it really depends what your own uh, point of view is in, in, the, in the matter that, that they address. Um, for example, uh, yeah, there are a lot of people who are very concerned when a ref refugee camp uh, is situated next to their uh, house. Uh, while others think, okay, that is not a big problem because we need to welcome people. So it, uh, and and I'm for sure this is a topic uh, where there is a lot of emotions in the political debates. These are the debates that are not, uh, yeah, that that can can be lead to very hot uh, discussions uh, in politics. Um, so in, my first reaction to your question is that uh, grassroots. Uh, it can be positive, but it can also be negative. It depends on the yeah on, on the interests and your own uh, perspective. Um, and when emotions are uh, coming from top down, I think it is more or less the same, I guess. Um, but what is important is that we all know where it is coming from, that there is transparency about it, and that if an emotion uh, is settled into policy making, that uh, there is accountability. And sometimes I do not see the accountability in the in the policy making that takes place. Uh, also from um, uh, from interest groups, for example, uh, in the Netherlands we don't have a transparency register uh, when a bill uh, is passed that you literally can see who was involved into uh, into the whole process. Um, and I think the the, the quality of policy making. Uh, can can be better if we know where that is coming from. And those are more the top-down uh, influences, uh, I guess, where you talked about. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it is, the, the key is in, in accountability and in transparency. And uh, uh, I hope that, that in the Netherlands, uh, we can uh, improve this. Is this giving a, an answer to your question? Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. There's a uh, one question, one more question um, in the chat, and I'm going to read it out uh, loud so you can all hear that. Um, there were many complicating factors regarding the current pandemic when it came to basing policy on science, and one of them was the scientific uncertainty regarding the efficacy uh, of the measures taken. This uncertainty often took the form of explicit disagreement between scientists. Uh, for example, Fauci versus Van Diesel on uh, the effectiveness of wearing face masks. Um, and I remember that one. I think Van Dissel is still denying that it really, really works, but he's not against it. Um, can you speak to the ways that different political parties responded to this uh, disagreement among experts in different ways and perhaps how they should respond? Yeah, yeah I think this is an interesting case uh, and, and a case it illustrates how politicians normally uh, can act, uh, and that is uh, pick and choose. Uh, so yeah, a politician is having an idea, a value, an election program, and when it fits, uh, they will make use of it, uh, of, of the argumentation of, uh, of, of science. And when it doesn't fit, they come up with another uh, yeah, scientific article that, that, that proves uh, the other side. This is a bit what uh, Louise Fresco, uh, I mentioned, uh, what she also uh, stated in her Konstam uh, lecture. Um, and I think this is exactly what we've seen in uh, the political debate when it comes uh, to the, the face masks. Um, and yeah, Van Dissel was 
indeed, still, he, he, yeah, he's not convinced that this will help. Uh, but in the, the time that his um, approach was dominant uh, for the uh, policy making, it was also the period in which the face masks were scarce in the Netherlands. Uh, so we couldn't provide everything uh, or anyone uh, who was in need for a face mask uh, with a face mask. Uh, I don't have proof for this, but I do think there was uh, a link uh, between uh, why he was... Uh, yeah, yeah a, a bit uh, reluctant uh, to the effectiveness of mouth masks and why uh, government really relied on that perspective because we couldn't provide what we uh, what we needed and later on there were more uh, masks available uh, and then yeah if what we have seen is that uh, politicians they made use of uh, of different uh, point of views and of different facts and uh, and stats um are you so now suggesting that from this or was um, not speaking the truth because for political reasons, because that would not really help our, our trust in science. No, I do think uh, that uh, he says what he wanted to say, but I do mm -hmm. think that uh, the politicians that they uh, thought, okay, this is helpful for us at this in this uh, moment in time. So I, I do, I do mm -hmm. think it's more on the hand of the politicians than of him. Yeah. But, but I'm not sure. I cannot prove this, of course. But for me, it was um, in retrospect. I, I I do see a change in, in point of views. I do see a change in measures, and I do see a change in what was available, uh, and I do see a change in uh, the data and the the scientific insights that were used by politicians. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm um, um, as a moderator. I once in a while look at the clock. And the clock tells me it's a quarter to six, and I was instructed to uh, uh, we could we could have an extra five minutes, but not much more. So I will do that. I would I would like to thank you very much for your for your talk and also for uh, answering all the questions. Um, and um, finally, I would um, like Lieven the cook as the dean of uh, of PPE to uh, have the last words here. Yeah. So I'd like to start to thank the speaker again for the session uh, because we didn't run out. Uh, we could continue for quite some time. I have several questions myself, but um, uh, it's very well like this for, uh, so thanks a lot for the engaging talk, uh, which was the final talk of our last term. So I think we had a very good last term week this week with uh, lectures uh, today by uh, Norsi Tyson, on Monday by William Thompson, uh, we had a lecture yesterday by Philip Pettit. Um, there have been organization um, uh, by the PPE uh, in uh, PPE in, uh, in person where they had talks with um, uh, the alumni. Very unfortunately, we had a last minute cancellation for the PPE uh, encounters. Um, uh, well, that, that would have been an extra activity. There have been vertical tables by uh, our students in attending uh, the last stream. So we had a kind of nice week, which is a kind of uh, a very good um, celebration of our five year existence of our program. So we are very glad uh, and thankful for uh, all of you participating in this. It's a kind of very strange thing to have to celebrate it in the middle of a corona pandemic uh, in this particular way. So we would have preferred to have it on campus with lots of uh, uh, drinks and bottles and so on. But um, we're very glad that we managed to put on uh, a nice program. And I would in particular, in particular like to thank Michelle Reinhardt for the complete, flawless, uh, impeccable organization of the whole thing. Uh, and the very smooth running of everything. So, okay. and hereby I think I will conclude the last room week and thank you all for attending yeah. and participating.